On the 30th of January 1943, Weber's 54th Jäger Regiment was in the Northern Pocket, and seems to have been the last element of the 100th Jäger Division still operating in this area. The rest of the 100th Jäger Division was either in the South, or maybe in the Central Pocket as well. Either way, the divisional elements in the centre and the south were destroyed on this day. Most of the divisional staff were captured, and although some resistance continued into the evening and the morning of the next day, in reality the division had disintegrated, with the exception of Weber's 54th Jäger Regiment in the north. And again, the sources are pretty vague with all this. The 13th Guards Rifle Division was now facing the remnants of the 100th Jäger Division in the north, but... Dragon and his unit found themselves moving south. They actually returned to the Pavlov's house area to find that the Germans had reoccupied the building in their absence. This meant that Dragon had to retake Pavlov's house once again, which they did. On the one hand, this shows that the house had actually been abandoned by the Soviets and had to be retaken, which is contrary to the propaganda about the house being held indefinitely after Pavlov had retaken it. But it also doesn't make much sense. If 13th Guards Rifle Division was in the north, why would they send Dragon south to retake a building he had abandoned previously? It doesn't make much sense to do that at this stage of the battle, making this whole account somewhat suspect. What is certain is that in Shumilov's area, the Soviet units were incredibly weak at this point. Yenisenko revealed that his companies were down to between 5 and 8 combat troops each, whereas they should have had over 100. And both he and Bamakov asked Shumilov for reinforcements. Shumilov didn't have much to spare, but he gave them some sapper battalions. And this just shows that it was the weakness of the Soviet forces, not necessarily the strength of the Germans, that had been the main reason for the slowness of the advance and why they had stopped in this area. However, with these reinforcements, Shumilov's forces struck again, this time advancing north into the city centre. The 38th Motorized Brigade and Losev's 29th Rifle Division pushed towards the square of the Fallen Fighters, while the 7th Rifle Corps moved along the bank of the Volga. German resistance here was fierce, unlike in the western portion of the southern pocket where German forces around the 298th Infantry Division simply collapsed under the pressure as several Soviet divisions advanced towards the railway line. Railway station number one fell, and the Soviets pushed the remnants of the German forces into the buildings east of the tracks. Now completely isolated at the Red Barracks, Oberst Lieutenant Mesic of the Croatian Legion opened negotiations with the Soviets and surrendered the garrison to the 298th Rifle Division. And just to round off the Croatians, approximately 715 of them marched into captivity, most of whom wouldn't see Croatia again. It's also worth pointing out that most of the remaining members of the 160th Panzer Battalion also surrendered at this point as well. Palace reported to the High Command that the Soviets would soon be at his building, and that they were fighting to the last. I mean, they're literally down the street from them. Some troops really had fought to the last bullet before surrendering, but Army Group Don reckoned that the remaining resistance in the south would end on the 31st. Realising this, Milch ordered that the Luftwaffe should only drop supplies in the south if requested, or if they definitely identified Germans there. This was probably because they knew that there was no point supporting a doomed effort and the focus really should be on the northern pocket where resistance could continue for longer. Strecker's roughly 20,000 troops did fight on without losing any ground on this day, probably because Rokossovsky had decided to take out the southern pocket first before turning to the northern one, taking the pressure off the north for now. Strecker even boasted that he had eliminated some enemy penetrations and took prisoners and General Rodenberg was actually fighting on the front line with his rifle until a bullet struck his adjutant in the head and the general decided that he'd had enough for now. At Wooster's bathhouse, the situation was desperate, but they were helped by the fact that the concrete roof of the bathhouse was able to withstand the Soviet shells landing upon them. 
They even managed to take out a T-34 and a KV tank with their artillery guns, at the cost of them using up the last of their anti-tank ammunition. Their 19 remaining high-explosive shells would only last for so long, and Wooster predicted that they wouldn't survive the next day. He therefore distributed the last of the food to his men, and told them that there would be no more, since the end was here now. He wasn't the only one, many others in the trenches in the northern pocket also came to the conclusion that this battle was almost over, and started to take things into their own hands. There's some more evidence of individual breakout attempts happening at this stage, with 8 or 10 groups reported to have broken out from the northern pocket. They were heading southwest towards Nernsnitschuskaya, although it's unlikely that they got that far. One group, led by Oberst Eichler from the 212th Regiment, the last of the 79th Infantry Division, did manage to get through the Soviet lines, but it's not clear what happened after that. The remaining regiment now consisted of just two companies in its 2nd Battalion. Many who didn't plan to escape considered what they would do with their last bullet, or deliberately stood out in the open hoping to get hit by a sniper. Others just accepted that they were about to become prisoners of war. Meanwhile, back in the Reich, Hitler celebrated the 10th anniversary of his seizure of power, and towards the end of his speech, he mentioned the sacrifice of the 6th Army as a necessary step to allow the German people to live on in the aftermath of their annihilation. The heroic struggle of our soldiers at the Volga should serve as a reminder to everyone that he must do his utmost in Germany's struggle for freedom, for the future of our Volk, and in a broader sense, for the preservation of our entire continent. The Almighty will be a just judge. It is our task to fulfil our duty in such a manner that we prove ourselves to him as the creator of the world in accordance with his law on the struggle for existence. Without ever despairing, we will spare neither life nor work in order to preserve the life of our Volk for the future. Then the great hour in this struggle will come, in which our Volk will be freed of its enemies on the outside. A new life will begin to bloom on the sacrifices of the dead and the ruins of our cities and villages. We will then continue to fashion that state in which we believe, for which we fight and work, the Germanic state of the German nation as the eternal and identical homeland of all men and women of our Volk, the National Socialist Greater German Reich. Surprisingly, there is evidence that Hitler's words inspired the men at Stalingrad. But then Hermann Goering gave a speech. And, well, that didn't go down so well. In fact, it really upset a lot of the men. A thousand years hence, Germans will speak of this battle with reverence and awe, and will remember that, in spite of everything, Germany's ultimate victory was decided there. In years to come, it will be said of the heroic battle of the Volga when you come to Germany, say that you have seen us lying at Stalingrad, as our honour and our leaders ordained that we should, for the greater glory of Germany. It may sound harsh to say that it was necessary that soldiers must die at Stalingrad, in the desert or in the icy wastes of the north. If we soldiers are not prepared to risk our lives, then we would have done better to enter a monastery. A soldier who goes into battle must know that he will probably not return. If he does come back, he should be thankful for his good fortune. But the problem is, is that you've conscripted them. You've force them to fight knowing that they would probably not return. That's the problem here. And in addition to him saying that they were all going to die, Goering tried to paint the 6th Army as a bunch of German Spartans fighting a heroic battle of Thermopylae at Stalingrad, which obviously didn't go down well with the men at Stalingrad who were still alive and listening to him speak on the radio. They now felt like they had been abandoned by their leadership and then written off as dead before they actually were. In effect, they were living corpses. The undead. I guess you could say, Nazi zombies. Well, to round off the propaganda effort, it made sense for the 6th Army to go out in a blaze of glory, fighting to the last man. So, Paulus really needed not to survive this battle, to show that he and his men would never give up, just like the rest of the Germans should never give up. And knowing that no German field marshal had ever surrendered, Hitler encouraged Paulus to take his own life by promoting him to the rank of field marshal on the 30th of January 1943. 
They also gave out 117 other promotions to officers in the 6th Army at the same time. But it's worth noting that this happened on the 30th. Some have said that the promotions occurred on the 31st, but they didn't. Hitler promoted Paulus on the 30th, which is an important point, as we'll see later. Hitler's hope was that Paulus would take his own life as an inspiration for the rest of Germany. And according to Colonel Adam, Paulus genuinely considered doing what Hitler was asking him to do. But then, when he asked Adam, the colonel told him that it would be best to share the fate of his men rather than take a shameful and cowardly way out, at which point he decided not to do it. Paulus remarked to General Pfeffer in their last meeting that he had no intention of shooting himself for the Bohemian Corporal. And when he heard that his troops were standing out in the open waiting to take a bullet for themselves, Paulus forbade them from doing that, which suggests that he wasn't thinking of self-deletion and was genuinely trying to keep as many men alive as possible. Near Paulus's headquarters, Colonel Gunter Ludwig held onto a cellar of an office building beside the Gorky Theatre, which was now right on the front lines. He had started talking to some Soviet officers about a possible surrender, and Schmidt heard about this and wanted him court-martialed. Putting this into perspective, 364 death sentences had been issued for cowardice during the final days of the siege, so this was a serious threat to Colonel Ludwig. Well, when a military policeman arrived and escorted Ludwig to see Schmidt, Ludwig rightfully expected the worst. However, Paulus seems to have intervened, and it was revealed in conversation that Schmidt was now interested in conducting surrender negotiations as well. Ludwig said to Schmidt that he could open negotiations with the Soviets at 9am the next day, which Schmidt accepted. Colonel Adam reports his disgust over this, since only the day before, Schmidt was threatening people with the firing squad. Clearly, circumstances had changed though, there was now no way that this fight could continue for much longer. And Adam also says that after their conversation between Ludwig and Schmidt, Schmidt didn't report this conversation to Paulus, only saying that Ludwig had started negotiations. This suggests to me that Paulus had already spoken to Schmidt before this point, indicating that Paulus knew what his chief of staff was doing, which is why he didn't need to report to Paulus after speaking to Ludwig, because Paulus already knew what was going on. Minutes later, General Rosker also informed Paulus that his division was done. He could no longer stop the Russian tanks approaching the department store, and he had nothing left to give. Paulus thanked him for his efforts and informed him that Schmidt had asked Ludwig to begin surrendered negotiations, again showing that he already knew. With the matter in hand, Paulus went to sleep, while the others were worried that a nearby Soviet tank would fire on the department building, because that's how close the Soviets were to ending this. On the morning of the 31st of January 1943, Schmidt, on Paulus's behalf, finally sent the congratulatory message to Hitler for his seizure of power, which had been written and dated on the 29th of January. But since it wasn't sent until the 31st, this has become fairly controversial. There's loads of different translations of this message, but here is one of them. On the anniversary of your ascension to power, the 6th Army sends greetings to its Führer. The swastika flag still flutters over Stalingrad. Should our struggle be an example to present and future generations never to surrender, even when hope is gone, then Germany will be victorious. Heil mein Führer signed Paulus Colonel General Stalingrad, 29th of January 1943, noon. Beaver says that the message was more likely to have been drafted and sent by Schmidt, which then buys into the whole Schmidt was really in charge narrative. But this begs the question as to why there was a delay in it being sent. If it was written on the 29th and the anniversary was on the 30th, why delay sending it until the 31st? What motivation would Schmidt have in delaying sending this message? And why would Paulus delay sending it? There's no reason, and none of this makes sense on the surface. So I'm going to cut to the chase. I think this message is propaganda. And the clue is in Hitler's reply. My Colonel General Paulus, already today the whole German people look upon this city with deep emotion, 
As always in world history, this sacrifice will not be in vain. The creed of von Clausewitz will find its fulfilment. The German nation now understands the whole difficulty of this battle and will make the greatest sacrifice, with thanks to you and your soldiers, your Adolf Hitler. The big problem with this reply is that Hitler had just promoted Paulus to the rank of Field Marshal the day before. So why would he address Paulus as Colonel General Paulus? Did Hitler suddenly forget that he had promoted Paulus the day before? Probably not. So either this reply that Adam records is not accurate, or something else is going on here. And let's think about the context. Goebbels is in the process of crafting Stalingrad into this massive inspirational story for a continuation of the struggle, allowing him to switch on the Total War campaign. Goebbels is also in charge of all the media in Germany. And so, do we really think he would leave it to Paulus to write one of the most important messages from the Sixth Army, the message congratulating Hitler on his 10th anniversary of seizing power. No, absolutely not. And the official narrative that Goebbels and Hitler want to paint is that Paulus was going to take his own life to show that their struggle, an important term in Nazi ideology, was worth fighting for. Paulus would be an example to the rest of the Germans to never surrender and to fight to the death. But that's from Hitler and Goebbels' perspective. Paulus himself knows that he's about to surrender. So why on earth would he say, our sacrifice will not be in vain, and then encourage the nation to make the greatest sacrifice when he is, in fact, not going to do it himself? He, he, you know, he wouldn't. He wouldn't say this which suggests to me that he didn't write this message, and neither did Schmidt. This message isn't Paulus' words. It's Goebbels wanting Paulus to say this. If these messages were ever sent at all, then both of them were most likely drafted on the 29th of January 1943, which is why Hitler says Colonel General Paulus in his reply. Then the anniversary happens on the 30th, with Hitler promoting Paulus to field marshal, which Goebbels wasn't able to predict. And then both messages were sent on the 31st, a few minutes before Paulus was captured. Why the delay? Because the swastika still flutters over Stalingrad until the last moment, which is when Paulus puts a gun to his temple, showing he continued the struggle right up until the end making him a real inspiration to all present and future generations in Germany who are about to fight a total war. Obviously, I, I can't confirm whether Goebbels himself was involved, but it's clear to me that both messages were written on the 29th, and there was probably some instruction on what Paulus should say. Maybe Paulus was still considering ending himself when these messages were written, but changed his mind on the 31st. Regardless, this sequence of events would explain why Pallas' message contradicts his own actions and why Hitler's reply refers to Pallas as Colonel General rather than Field Marshal. Yes, it's a bit speculative, but it makes more sense than a lot of the other narratives out there, so let me know what you guys think. Overnight and into the early hours of the 31st of January 1943, Colonel Bermakov's 38th Motorized Brigade, supported by the 329th Sapper Battalion and other nearby units, had surrounded the square of the fallen fighters and the Univermak, hammering the area with artillery fire and cutting all telephone lines between Paulus and the other units still resisting elsewhere. There was no way out now, and Paulus knew it. The final two messages from the 6th Army stated that the Soviets were at the door and that the 6th Army's headquarters were burning papers and equipment. At 0700 hours, Boris von Neidhardt came out of a basement under a white flag and told a nearby Soviet officer, Fyodor Yelchenko, that the 6th Army command wanted to negotiate a surrender. Now, Paulus's headquarters was in the Univermag department store located here on the map. However, ACF makes a big deal about the 64th Army and the Don Front listing the Executive Committee as a location of Paulus's headquarters. It was at this location that Paulus surrendered at, suggesting that the Univermag may not have been the actual headquarters for the 6th Army. ACF then says that the department store had the words department store on the front of the building. So there's no way that the Soviets would have confused the two buildings, proving 
that the executive building was the real headquarters. However, we know from the German sources that it was Colonel Ludwig who had been tasked to initiate the negotiations, and his unit's position was in the cellar of the executive committee building near the Gorky Theatre. Definitely not an ideal source, but there was a Reddit post and a forum post for the computer game Enlisted, which I've never played, showing pictures of the executive committee, and the building looks very similar in style to the Univermag department store. I'm having to use Reddit and a gaming website because I'm having trouble accessing Russian websites for some reason. There are other pictures of the building online, but they're really blurry, so this is the best I can do for now. Rokossovsky also says Sixth Army's final headquarters was the Univermag department store, and I think the confusion comes from Colonel Adam. Adam did not witness the negotiations, and when Adam describes the events, he's actually quoting from General Roska, who was there and saw what happened. So, straight away, Adam isn't a primary source, he's actually a secondary source in this instance, and Adam is also writing decades after the war, while quoting paragraphs of what Roska supposedly said to him, as if he has this special ability to just remember a book worth of exact words that people said to him decades previously. Obviously, this is nonsense. Adam is not a stenographic record. Adam is just recalling what was said from his mind, and there's no way to verify any of it. He could just be making it all up. So, with this source being problematic, at the very least, if we remove what Adam said from the picture, an obvious answer appears to us. Paulus' headquarters was at the Univermag department store, but the negotiations and surrender took place at the executive committee building, where Colonel Ludwig was positioned. The Soviets therefore concluded that the executive committee building was Palace's headquarters, not the Univermag department store, explaining the discrepancy. Either way, surrender negotiations took place between the 6th Army and Colonel Bermakov and Major General Laskin, Chief of Staff of the Soviet 64th Army. The sources give different accounts, but it appears that Roska and Schmidt conducted the negotiations, and that Paulus avoided conducting them personally. The excuse was that he was unwell, and that Roska and Strecker were now in charge of their independent pockets, so Paulus wasn't really in command anymore. This was probably an excuse, but even so, there was nothing left to negotiate over. After two hours of talks, Major General Laskin, 64th Army's Chief of Staff, accepted the unconditional surrender of the German 6th Army command. However, Paulus technically didn't surrender. The Field Marshal neither fell on his sword, nor surrendered. He simply allowed himself to be captured. This, therefore, bypassed Hitler's desire for him to end himself. No German Field Marshal had ever surrendered, and neither did Paulus, since he was captured and hadn't given up. Paulus, his faith in Hitler shattered, refused to play his assigned role in the Führer's tragedy, but neither could he bring himself to surrender. Like many of his colleagues, he had so internalised the anti-Bolshevik nature of the struggle that formal capitulation was unthinkable, so he simply let himself be taken prisoner. If you think about it, this is really clever on Paulus's part. Technically, Paulus wasn't the first German Field Marshal to surrender because he didn't actually surrender. He was captured and never formally gave up. So he therefore avoided the pistol to the temple and also the shame of surrender. And I just think that's amazing. His army surrendered, but Paulus did not. Well played, sir. Well played. Well, as Roska and Schmidt were ordering their forces to stand down, Major General Laskin asked Paulus to order the Northern Group of Forces to surrender. But Paulus said he had no communications with Strecker, and that he was no longer in charge since he had been captured. Well, we know that he did, in fact, have communications with Strecker, because Paulus was still reporting about the situation with Strecker's pocket up to the 29th, and that he therefore had radio communication with him. Thus, the excuse by Paulus to not order the surrender of Strecker's forces because he had no communication is, again, probably Paulus avoiding the idea that he had formally surrendered. And this is also likely where the idea comes from that Schmidt was the one really in charge, 
when in reality Paulus was in charge right up until the end, when he suddenly fell ill and feigned ignorance. It's obviously all a ploy to avoid having a field marshal surrender or have Paulus commit Sudoku. Anyway, Paulus emerged from the ruins with Schmidt and Adam, as shown by this picture, and they were taken by vehicle to the 64th Army's headquarters at 1200 hours, leaving Rosca to organise the capitulation of the rest of the forces. The fighting didn't entirely stop, with the 284th Rifle Division marching south and capturing the 9th of January Square, linking up with the 64th Army. So the rest of the Southern Pocket only surrendered later in the day. And Shumilov questioned Paulus, asking him why he had decided to give in, but not personally order both the Southern and Northern Pockets to surrender as well. And Paulus simply said that he had been ordered to fight to the end, and that's exactly what he had done. We did not lay down our weapons. We were played out and could not fight any longer. After your forces wedged into and approached the remnants of our forces, we had no means of defending ourselves. There was no ammunition, and therefore the struggle ceased. And as Paulus talked to Shumilov, Manstein decided to send the 6th Army a final message, its lateness symbolic of the lack of support that Manstein has shown to Paulus throughout the campaign. To the comrades of 6th Army, our thanks to you for your heroic sacrifices. The battle for the fulfilment of your legacy will be left for us. But of course, they never received this message because Paulus was already in Soviet hands. In addition to Paulus, many other German generals also surrendered on the 31st of January, including Schlomer and Heitz, as well as most of the divisional commanders in the area. General Bratescu of the Romanian 1st Cavalry Division, which had been fighting alongside the 14th Panzer Division, also seems to have surrendered on this day. Now, some of the sources say that at this moment, the 14th Panzer Division didn't surrender and actually tried to fight northwards towards Strecker's pocket, but didn't get very far. It's not clear, but it seems to have surrendered on the 2nd of February or possibly earlier. But I have no idea because I've given you all the information I have on this incident. So to prevent any confusion, I'm just going to remove the division from the map at this point. But just know that the 14th Panzer Division continued to fight northwards during this time. In total then, an estimated 50,000 Axis surrendered when the Southern Pocket fell. Although it's not clear because we know resistance by individuals and small groups continued after the formal surrender. There's also evidence that the Soviets executed a number of the men, as well as some Germans who resisted. However, they also killed Hiwis, which still made up a portion of the 6th Army. Not all Hiwis were executed, but it's clear from NKVD reports and German accounts that some were killed off immediately. Those who weren't shot undoubtedly ended up in Soviet penal battalions or maybe even the slave labour camps. It must have been upsetting for Chirikov that he hadn't taken Paulus prisoner or hadn't been the one that the 6th Army had surrendered to. He only took a few of the other generals prisoner, including... Zeilitz and General Korfus of the 295th Infantry Division. After meeting Chirikov, Korfus said this to him. It is the tragic point of world history that the two greatest men of our times, Hitler and Stalin, have been unable to find common ground so as to beat the mutual enemy, the capitalist world. Even Chirikov seemed startled by this declaration. Zeilitz grabbed Korfus's arm and cried, why don't you stop talking? And Corfus replied, I feel entitled to say this because it is the truth. Well, Corfus, it turns out that people don't want the truth, so just stick to tanks. The Northern Pocket continued to fight on, with only minor attacks occurring here on the 31st. Nonetheless, these skirmishes resulted in heavy losses for the Germans, and 16th Panzer Division reported that its heavy weapon ammunition was now exhausted, so it was vulnerable to a major infantry or tank attack. But despite all this, the Germans hadn't given up yet, and after a demolition charge blew up the building, 12 men under the command of Hatman Wittmann managed to attack and retake Hall 6A in the Barricade Factory, capturing five Soviet anti-tank guns in the process. This was, perhaps, the last tactical victory for the Germans 
in this battle. Although the Soviets had lost 50 men in this area, while the Germans had lost about 100. So it was a hard-won victory, even if 12 men did manage to retake the hall. Wooster's position at the bathhouse was approached by three Soviet officers who offered him surrender negotiations. But even though he was undecided, he turned them down. He and his men knew they wouldn't last much longer, so they began to destroy their equipment and documents, preparing them for the inevitable. The Luftwaffe managed to drop 74 or 118 tons of supplies for the northern pocket, which, assuming most of it was collected, must have been a significant amount for the few remaining men. Strecker estimated that he had 50,000 men left, although they had almost run out of food and ammunition. Rokossovsky still wasn't in a rush to destroy the northern pocket, and since Strecker looked determined to hold on, and there might be an opportunity to get Paulus to convince Strecker to surrender, Rokossovsky asked the Stavka if he could hold off a little while longer. The Stavka agreed, although it was decided that the next attack would go in the next day. Forces from the south would be transferred north once the fighting in the city centre was over, and these reinforcements would help Batov, Zadov and Chirikov complete their task. The aim, once again, was to use artillery and airstrikes to soften up the Germans and minimise their own manpower losses. Meanwhile, that evening, Paulus was escorted to Rokossovsky's headquarters for a chat. Rokossovsky, Voronov and Dyatlenka offered Paulus smokes and a glass of hot tea, which he accepted, and they discussed the treatment of the prisoners of war. Paulus asked them not to compel him to answer questions which would breach his military oath, and Rokossovsky assured him that they wouldn't do that. But once more, Rokossovsky urged Paulus to get the northern pocket to surrender. He declined, claiming that, as a prisoner of war, he had no right to issue such orders. Since my troops were split into two groups, I was the commander of the other pocket only in theory. Orders came separately from Führer headquarters, and each group was commanded by a different general. Unfortunately for the Soviets, they were unable to persuade Paulus to surrender the northern pocket, meaning that they would have to finish it off themselves. Paulus asked if they could feed the prisoners and give them medical attention, and Voronov explained that they were struggling to cope with the mass of prisoners, but that they would do what they could. And this makes me think that the Soviets were genuinely having trouble coping with the sheer volume of prisoners, since an extra 50,000 people is a lot of mouths to feed and take care of, but we'll discuss that in the future. Just after noon on the 1st of February 1943, Hitler held a military conference with Zeitzler and some of the generals, and I've done a more in-depth video on this conference here because it's interesting in its own right. But Hitler spent a considerable amount of time discussing why Paulus had chosen to surrender like a coward rather than taste a bullet. It was hoped that Paulus was just wounded and would die later, or that the Soviets were lying, but if not, Hitler complained that this had tarnished the myth he was trying to build of Stalingrad as a last heroic stand of the defeated army. This hurts me, because the heroism of so many soldiers is nullified by one single characterless weakling. What is life? Life is the nation. The individual must die anyway. Later, he said, how easy is it to do something like that? The pistol, that's simple. What sort of cowardice does it take to pull back from it? This comment being interesting, considering what Hitler was going to do in 1945. Back at Stalingrad, unorganised resistance continued in the city centre, preventing Shumilov's forces from moving north to help take out the northern pocket. The Luftwaffe also dropped 73 or 98 tonnes of ammunition and food, but in the grand scheme of things, it didn't matter, because the heaviest Soviet bombardment of the war up to this date had begun. Soviet artillery and airstrikes smashed the positions of Strecker's pocket with a density of 170 artillery guns per kilometre. After an hour and a half, the Soviet troops advanced in practically all areas in the West, as a lot of the Germans simply gave up. Batov's and Zadov's armies ripped through the western face of the pocket, with Soviet troops pushing through both the Barricade and Tractor Factory villages, placing the German remnants holding Hill 107.5 under immense pressure from three sides. The Germans had to fall back, which they did towards the east. 
Troops are fighting without heavy weapons or supplies. Men collapsing from exhaustion. Freezing to death, still holding weapons. Strecker. Field dressings among the combat troops have run out. In places, the troops have used up all their ammunition. They help one another. The positions can no longer be supplied with ammunition. When an officer reported that their neighbouring 60th Motorised and 24th Panzer Divisions had disintegrated, Hull was left with a difficult decision. He could pull back and leave all his wounded, or stay with them and surrender together. He allowed his unit to pull back, but he stayed behind with a few others to guard the wounded, and he would ultimately surrender the next day. 20,000 Germans surrendered during this day's attack, which meant that probably less than 30,000 remained, and Strecker was rightly predicting that this pocket would fall the next day. But Chuikov's forces had struggled to take ground, and only did so slowly, as the soldiers of the 305th Infantry Division and the nearby 212th Grenadier Regiment somehow managed to repel most attacks. At Wooster's bathhouse, the gun positions before it were taken in a surprise attack, but there was enough infantry ammunition left for them to retain the bathhouse and keep fighting a little bit longer. Overnight, on the 1st to the 2nd of February, General Strecker talked with the other remaining division commanders to discuss the situation. He was unwilling to surrender despite several calls to do so, and it was only when Lenski said that his troops had already started negotiating for their own surrender, and that he actually agreed with them, that Strecker realised it, it was all over. He couldn't continue the fight if there was nothing left to fight with. So he therefore drafted two messages. The first at 0700 hours, saying that all fighting was about to end, and that their weapons would be destroyed. And at about the same time, the 305th Infantry Division received the order that fighting was to cease, and the Soviets would be there within the hour, confirming that Strecker was telling them to lay down their arms. Then the second message from Strecker to the High Command an hour later said that the 11th Army Corps and its six divisions had fought to the last. Well, it seems that the German will to resist had more or less evaporated, and even Churikov was able to advance on this day. One battalion in the 24th Panzer Division had just eight men left with one officer, and it was observed overnight and in the morning that the German troops had visibly given up the fight. So, in some cases, the Soviet troops took the initiative and attacked early. After the first hour or so, most of the shooting just stopped, and the Germans started surrendering. Soviet riflemen swept through the remaining sectors of the pocket in what they described as a bloodless assault. But it wasn't entirely bloodless, as thousands of German soldiers decided to keep fighting, or hide, or take their own lives, or even attempt to escape. However, it is true that organised resistance had ended. Wooster describes how the men just dropped their weapons and accepted their fate, while he and a couple of others tried to run, but were quickly apprehended. Strecker's last message was sent at 0830 hours, saying, Long live the Fuhrer! And another incomplete message was sent at 0920 hours, saying, The Russians are penetrating, fighting, tractor works. And the fact that this message is incomplete makes it seem like Strecker's 11th Army Corps had fought to the very last round in dramatic circumstances before surrendering to the 66th Army. However, most accounts fail to state that a real, final message was actually received from the pocket at 12.35 hours. And it wasn't from the 11th Army Corps. Here is the actual final message from the 6th Army. Cloud base 15,000 feet, visibility 7 miles, clear sky, occasional scattered nimbus clouds, temperature minus 31 degrees centigrade, over Stalingrad fog and red haze. Meteorological station now closing down. Greetings to the homeland. Yeah, not quite as dramatic as the propaganda made out. By the early afternoon, the fighting had ceased. Lieutenant General Gunther von Angern of the 16th Panzer Division was the only division commander from the Northern Pocket not to surrender, choosing instead to attempt to break out, and then, when that failed, he decided to do what Paulus did not do to himself. The rest ended up in Soviet captivity, along with perhaps 40,000 soldiers. The Luftwaffe tried to identify any holdouts and did drop some supplies, but they knew that the pocket had collapsed. 
At 14.10 hours, the Stavka ordered the withdrawal of the 21st and 64th Armies, leaving just the 62nd, 65th and 66th Armies behind to mop up and replenish their ranks. And so, the Battle of Stalingrad, or rather the Campaign of Stalingrad, was officially over. However, it technically wasn't over. The fighting actually continued beyond the 2nd of February 1943, as we'll hear about next time in what will be the final episode of this series. Yes, we're ending on an uneven episode number, however, it's three episodes a season, and 17 times 3 is 51, so we actually round out the 17th season perfectly, which I'm counting as a win. Anyway, next time we'll look at the aftermath, summarise the whole battle, discuss the statistics regarding losses and prisoners, and consider some other interesting points as well. So I'll leave it there. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.